Today we celebrate the Nativity of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And to understand why this is a feast, we need to go back to the beginning. In the book of Genesis, right after the fall of Adam and Eve, in Genesis chapter 3, God told the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and hers. He will crush your head, you will strike his heel. That's the good news that was announced by God immediately after the fall. Who is the woman? We find out in the wedding feast at Cana because Mary goes to Jesus to tell him that they have run out of wine, a disaster for the wedding, but also symbolic of the Old Testament had come to a close. And how was Jesus going to react to that? Jesus says, woman, what does that have to do with you and me? Now, he refers to her as woman precisely because she is the woman that will fulfill Genesis chapter 3.15. Mary is the one who prompts Jesus to begin his ministry by this miracle of changing water into wine, and Jesus agrees and begins his ministry. Mary is the one who tells the stewards of the wedding feast, do whatever he tells you. Now we hear this title, woman, again at the cross, when Jesus, one of the last words he says, woman, behold your son, referring to John the Evangelist. So this title, Woman, is now fulfilled in Mary. She is the new Eve who reverses the no of Eve to a yes, a yes that crushes the head of the serpent. Her total submission, let it be done to me according to your will, begins the whole era of salvation. This is why when the wording of God to the serpent, I will put enmity. Enmity means total opposition. No cooperation whatsoever. Now to sin would be to cooperate in some way with the enemy, which means Mary was free from sin. No cooperation, enmity, which explains why when the angel Gabriel visited Mary, he addressed her as full of grace, full of grace. The only way you can be full of grace is to have no sin at all, which is why she, right from her conception she does not cooperate with original sin and at the time of the Annunciation she still is not cooperating because the angel says full of grace as her title. Now to be full of grace means not to sin, not to sin means not to experience any corruption of one's body at the end of one's life, which is why the church teaches Mary was assumed body and soul into heaven at the end of her life, to join with her son in the victory in heaven. So the assumption there is taught, which is why we see Mary in Revelation chapter 12 in heaven, clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, crowned with 12 stars, which means she is reigning in heaven as queen. All of this centers around the feast today, Mary's birth. And in that birth, the angels sing and we rejoice because she will say yes, she will reverse the Noah of Eve, she's the new Ark of the Covenant, and our salvation now is secured. We just turn briefly to the gospel, the genealogy. Notice that this is Matthew's genealogy. And there's four women mentioned in the genealogy. Very unusual at the time to mention women at all. And each of the four women had checkered pasts. Tamar was involved in the seduction of her father-in-law to have a child. Rahab was a harlot, but sheltered the people from Israel who were scouting out the Promised Land. Ruth was from Moab, an enemy of God, but she followed her mother-in-law, Naomi, faithfully to Israel, and Ruth eventually would be the great-grandmother of King David through Boaz, the kinsman-redeemer. And then the wife of Uriah, 
she committed adultery, but all four are important in this genealogy because Mary would be criticized at the time of the birth of Jesus. What Matthew is saying here through the genealogy is that God will use anyone. He'll use us. Even though we may have a checkered past, things that we're not proud of, yet we can cooperate with grace and bring birth to Christ in our culture. That's how we participate in this great feast. So let's celebrate the feast with great joy and ask God to continue to pour his grace into our soul that we would indeed be like Mary, always giving birth to Christ.